three, two, one. Ooh, welcome to the Fourth Line Podcast, part of Full Press Radio. This is November the 29th, 2021. With you today is myself, Carl, and Stevie Nick. Back for another chilly Monday in the middle of hockey season. That's why we're wearing our matching gray hoodies. Yeah, I mean, this it's our show uniform, right? That's Ever since you called me out for wearing Red Wings swag every week, <laughs> I figured I should conform to our dress code. It Just go plain. It is nice. It is uh, It is chilly out where you are. You said you got snow this week. Yeah, we got some snow on Sunday. Which I think officially means that it's time to take hockey team seriously season. I think so. And there are some teams that are uh, that are in trouble and some teams that are not in trouble. Yeah. I mean, some teams that are literally like sh- struggling, they're in that kind of a trouble. Uh, we're going to get to all kinds of stuff this week. It was a, a weird and interesting week in the world of sports, especially the NHL. Yeah, a lot happened this week. It feels like there's a lot of little things that happened uh, throughout the league, like a lot of small incidents within games. But there was also bigger things happening, like bigger picture with some teams and the league in general. Yeah, so let's start with the biggest, I would say the biggest news of the week. Montreal Canadiens, they have been struggling. Went to the Stanley Cup Finals last year, then hoped to run it back, not going well. And someone finally paid the price for it. GM Mark Bergevin out, former New York Rangers general manager Jeff Gorton in. Is that how you say it? Gorton? Gordon? I thought Gort- they said it. I thought you're supposed to say it like the race car driver. Gordon. Jeff- Jeff Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. Let's go with that then. That's easy <laughs> enough. I'll go get my Jeff Gordon swag. We can just talk about him for the rest of the show. Welcome to the show, everybody. Mispronouncing names and race car drivers. Um, Not terribly survive- surprising about Mark Bergevin, though, based on the season that they're having. Is the cup run last year the worst thing that could have happened for Mark Bergevin? No. Because... That team overperformed in those playoffs. Yep. Uh, Very much so. If they had just gone out in the first or second or even third round, he probably would have had a longer leash this year. You think so? Yes, I do. I think that a performance that they had in the playoffs, going to the Stanley Cup Finals, it raises expectations for the following season. Especially when they had some changes to their roster, but I think like the core of who was part of that playoff team is still here. I mean, Carey Price isn't there, and he's 90% of the reason that they made it that far. Nor is Shea Weber. (laughs) <laughs> right like like carry price got incredibly hot looked like carry price of old and he hasn't been he hasn't played a single game so far this year Shea definitely weber, hurting them absolutely Shea weber also hasn't played a single game this year so you take i mean you take your captain away you take your starting goaltender away there is no reason to assume any team will be able to match the expectations of last year and when you look at how they did in the regular season last year just getting into the playoffs right going on the run as the four seed in the North, it, it's not entirely unexpected. So let me ask you this. On his way out, Bergevin said, this team is better than their on-ice performance so far this year. Do you agree with that? No. No, this team is their on-ice performance this year. I like, think that's exactly right. And that's why he's fired because, because he thinks that this team is better than what they're showing up with. And they're not, this is the team you've built Mark. When you lose, I mean, when you don't have a red hot carry price, which he didn't for several years, the last bit and the team wasn't good because they're not. But I mean, he made some good individual moves. I think it just never really came together 
on the whole. Like I would say his tenure here was completely average. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't awful, but it wasn't great either. Yeah, I think, I mean, what moves do you look at and think that's a good move? Well, you brought in Nick Suzuki. It cost him Max Pacioretty. Yeah. Would you rather Nick Suzuki or Max Pacioretty right now? Probably Nick Suzuki. You're right. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I just, Uh, what I do is I come out aggressive, give myself some time to think about it. And then agree with you. I know. We've, we've done this song and dance many times, Carl. <laughs> uh, the offer sheet for Sebastian Ajo was great. That was amazing when he did that. What yeah, was not was so great was letting Kakanyemi go at the price that he let him walk for this year. Oh, and I think we've seen it. Was, it's interesting seeing what Kakanyemi's done in Carolina. There, he started with, you know, scoring a goal against Montreal and, and everyone got real excited, but he has not been a great player for Carolina. Yeah. Uh, agreed. He, uh, see, now I'm going down this roster to see how they all came in. Did he bring in Drew in, or was that before Bergevin? Yep. He brought in Drew. In. I think I'd prefer Sergachev. Yes. So I'm looking at his list of, of draft moves, Sergachev is the best pickup that he did in the draft. And he traded him away, <laughs> traded him away. Of course. Uh, Cause, Cause that's the biggest issue that I have with his time here is his draft record and, and also development record, right? Looking at who's been, who's on this team, how they got there. That's a problem. Totally agree. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. So with Jeff Gordon coming in, um, I mean, obviously, he's got a big history in NASCAR. Uh, how's he going to do as the GM of a team that exclusively has hired French general managers? I'm not sure Jeff Gordon speaks a lick of French. Well, he's, he's not California. Yeah, he's American, which is hilarious. But he's not the GM, though, is he? I think he's like the president of hockey operations or something like that. Okay. They gave him, I think it's a bit of a workaround to not to for him not being able to speak french okay uh, yeah you're right and i i i now i'm seeing that they that they're looking to bring in a french gm to work with him cool report into jeff gordon uh look i think jeff gordon did a great job with the new york rangers and their rebuild and then you know his firing from that team was under some weird circumstances i think uh, and when it happened, I recall being like, why would they do that? He's been doing a great job. So, uh, you know, I think it's a good get for the Canadians. I think in the, in the GM market, there's so rarely like a piece, a GM sitting out there that I look at and say, that's a, that's a guy that should be signed and should be working right now. Cause I feel like so often these guys go and you're like, yeah, I like, I, he should have been fired. Like he's made some really bad moves, but this is one that I fully agree. Great pickup for them. Does Pierre Maguire speak French? We? Oui? I don't actually know if he does. It's just a good, it's, it's nice that he's been picked up by a team now. Cause now we don't have to hear his name pop up in the rumor mill every time a GM position is open. And, and yet you still did. <laughs> I did, but yeah. it's the first time I heard it. It's true. Yeah. But that's great. <laughs> because now we don't have to think about that. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think this puts the Canadians in a better position than they were in last week. I th- yeah, I think so too. But here's the thing about these management uh, positions switching over is you make these moves to, to affect performance in the long term. Yes. Right. These are not on ice this week performance moves. That would be player moves. Yeah. So I think the team's still going to be in for a rough rest of season. Uh, I believe Dominic Ducharme is safe for, you know, the imminent future anyways. 
for now. Yep. Uh, well, it's November. Today's November 29th. You don't really fire people in December. That's not a very nice thing to do. So if he can make it till Wednesday, then he's good. Um, so for right now, he's safe. But this is a long, longer term play for the Habs. Yeah. And I like looking at their roster. I'm not sure that there's a ton of option to blow it up this year, even deadline wise. Like, yes, they have. I mean, Jake Allen is a piece that you could move out. He's still got an extra year on his deal. So you might get even a little bit more back for him. Um, Lots of guys with term though. So if they decide that they want to move on from them, then they can get some good value back. Right. And I could see that, but outside of, of him. Yeah. I'm not, there's not a lot of like expiring deals that would be appetizing. No, definitely not. How does this team have zero cap space? That's terrifying. I mean, when you have six wins and no cap space. Yeah. That's a problem. Big problem. All right. I don't want to talk about the Habs anymore. (laughs) Let's go talk about then the Pittsburgh Penguins. Big news for them this week as the ownership group behind the Boston Red Sox, Fenway Sports, is finalizing a deal. I think it is, you know, they're just working through the transfer, things like that, but they are buying the Pittsburgh Penguins from a well known owner, Mario Lemieux, and group for $900 million. That's a lot. That's a lot of dollars for the Pittsburgh Penguins. For a team that like like prior to Sidney Crosby was about to go under. That they were going to have to move to be able to keep it there. And if, if not for Mario buying the team, if not for Crosby and Malkin getting drafted by this team, who knows where this franchise would be. Those guys turned this team around and made it a $900 million business. Yeah. Good on them. Mario... I probably bought himself a nice dinner last night. I would, I would think so. Now he is staying on as the uh, kind of the management side hockey representative. I think Um, same position that he has now, right? Yeah. Uh, Still, you know, part owner in the team, uh, not sold a hundred percent. But if you look at like looking at evaluations, because I think every year, right. You see like Forbes, or Sportico, or whoever come out with a list of NHL franchise values. This last one that came out, uh, looks at Pittsburgh, $845 million was the evaluation that they gave them. Uh, pretty on par. The average NHL franchise clocks in at $930 million. So wow. uh, kind of on par expectation for what they would be, which honestly surprises me how much these NHL teams are worth. I also, I would have thought that you? it would be, yeah, I honestly, I thought it would be a little bit less. Interesting. Well, I mean, if the average nine is 900, that's gotta be like what? 15 to 20 teams that are worth that. Yeah. And there's from 900, you're looking at like the red wings are just over a billion. They're the first team in the billions. They're a 10th. Uh, you, then you've got teams below uh, like eight under 800,000. Somehow the two-time defending Stanley Cup champion, Tampa Bay Lightning, not making a lot of money down there in Tampa, even though they're winning cups. Uh, they're because they're spending over the cap every year. Well, that's because they've got guys on, the guys that can't stay healthy. Um, but I mean, and then you've got the Kraken, right? And we know very well what their price tag to get into the league was. So yeah, um, that's kind of where they, that puts them. But an interesting move. Do you think it's this will impact having, I would say, I mean, Fenway sports is one of the biggest sports conglomerate ownership groups out there. I think having them in hockey is a good sign for the health of the league. Yeah, I totally agree. Like it's an interesting move because it's not a single person and it's not a family kind of business. Like it's a portfolio thing right they've got the red Sox. they've got what liverpool they I own think, a nascar team soccer team they own a nascar team so it's it's just kind of an interesting move for them like the only thing and i know this because i'm from there and they're my favorite team but the red wings are part of olympia entertainment who owns also the tigers and also the pistons but that's all within the same city 
was going to say, and I think, I mean, that's a pretty a common thing. The, the one comparable that I have um, with them would be the Avalanche, um, who are owned by the Cronkies, who own, they own a soccer team. I forget which one. They also own the LA Rams. Um, I believe they own an MLS team, an arena football league team. So like similarly, uh, Cronky Sports and Entertainment owns many parts of it. And I think I mean, as we see more of those show up into the league where they're not really like, they're strictly looking at it from a financial point of view. Totally. Yeah. It's not a hobby. It's not like, yeah, I've always wanted to own a hockey team. It's can this make me and my group money? And they're saying yes to that. And honestly, it's a good thing for the fans too, because what that means is they're going to make moves to bring in revenues and they know that what's going to bring in revenues is bringing in fans. So they're going to create experiences that fans want to be a part of. Exactly. I mean, we see that with they've they've done great things with the Red Sox, obviously. I mean, named after Fenway, that's kind of where this group got their start. But I'm excited for the fact that that's something that could be happening. And I'm curious if how ownership continues to evolve and change as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, I th- we might start to see it with other teams throughout the league, too, right? Yeah, and I, I do find I mean, this kind of was on the rumor mill for a while, but it is interesting that it, it did kind of come to like a head right uh so often it ta- seems to take a long time and there's rumors of it happening and then they fall apart it was nice to just see a, a good clean sale yeah for sure now it is it does still need to be approved by the nhl board of governors and i believe it will be complete by the end of the year yeah and it, i don't see any issues with no with anything that we've seen uh, we've talked to our lawyers nick and uh they've said everything looks good <sighs> yeah they did uh, let's head to, I know that you said, I'm, I'm sick of talking about Montreal. I don't want to talk about them anymore. Let's talk about something else that you probably don't wish to talk about the Boston Bruins. I was going to say, I think there might be two or th- two things left on our list that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> well, let's talk about this one. Let's see how it goes. Maybe this might lead us straight to our break. Actually. Yep. No, that'll probably lead us into our break. Maybe. Uh, so- Two things. So two things happened with the Bruins today, essentially. I think. Well, yet last or was, night into was today. one yesterday. Yeah. Okay. I think it kind of started yesterday. So one, Brad Marchand, the team's leading scorer, the leading point getter, suspended three games today for a slew fit on Oliver Ekman Larson in last night's game against the Vancouver Canucks. So this is his. Any guess? What would, what would your guess be on how many times Brad Marchand has been suspended? Oh, I'll say five. You are under. This was his seventh suspension. Seventh? Seventh suspension, yeah. Good thing he's a star player. Well, th- that's that's the star player level of suspension yeah. right there. Right? That's Three not games. even. Yeah. Uh, so he has, according to Sportsnet stats, uh, he has been suspended seven times. He has been fined an additional five. Those seven suspensions have totaled 22 games. So this is an average length of suspension for him. Uh, and in total, he has forfeited $971,397.61. That dollar amount is insane to me. <laughs> I, that's that, that was one thing that came to my mind, right? Like you were suspended 22 games, I guess also the fines. But 22 games works out to that. And I know that, like, yeah, I guess salary-wise, he's missed a quarter of a season. But come on now. Oh, man, that's so crazy. And we, we'll we pick up on this again later, I think, because Brad Marchand was also involved in a second incident this week. But it was I, I watched a video right before we started because I wasn't watching the game live. And it was a pretty nasty play. And like, it was a. Was he penalized on the play? Uh, I'll Do confirm, you know? but I, I don't believe he was. He should have been because it was very clear what happened. His like, like, like Ekman Larson landed, <laughs> looked like on the numbers, like his feet were up in the air. What's what's even more? No, he was not penalized for that. Um, what's more dangerous with that so it was a slew foot going into the boards and so he's skating towards the boards slew foot 
lands on his back and also like feet first right into the boards. Like arguably one of the worst ways that you could slew foot a guy. Just awful. And like, if I was his teammate, I'd be, I'd be ticked off. Like, okay. Yeah. First of all, like, don't do that, but whatever the game happens is fast. The, the bigger thing is like, we need you out there. You know, our season's going okay this year. Not not great, not where we need it to be. We need our best players on the ice scoring goals. And that well, and that's their biggest issue right now is the lack of goals from this team, right? In the last while, they have been struggling. Their best players have been quite absent. So yeah, for him to be gone and have to rejig, rework these lines for the next three games, I think is gonna be for one, a wake up call, right? And I think we'll touch in a second on on another wake up call that this team's getting, but I mean, they need more from everyone, especially offensively. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So like, I'm glad he got suspended three games. I don't know if it's enough. Like if this was Tom Wilson and he did that, would we be calling for more? I honestly think, I think this is the Brad Marchand, Tom Wilson version of the suspension. I think three games is more than what the average person would have gotten. I think maybe one, maybe two. I could see the average person get away with nothing. But three games for for this slew foot seems pretty yeah, pretty reasonable. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the other guy. All right, Jake DeBrusque. Also a Boston Bruin, also uh Gonna, I guess, missed some time. Healthy scratch last night, uh, which led to him, his agent, uh, asking for a trade today. Gotta wonder which came first news of the scratch or request of the trade. Yeah, I and it, I think, in those two go very hand in hand, right? And what's interesting about it is that they, um, this has been far from behind the scenes, right? Bruce Cassidy's was asked about this and he, I mean, he didn't shy away from it. He didn't say, we're not going to talk about it. He says, I think what happens with Jake and what we've seen over the last few years is that when there's, when the production is there, you're getting more second effort. They kind of go hand in hand. And when it's not there, we lose, lose a little bit of that. And that's been the ask of him for a number of years. No drop off on this side of the ledger, just because the production isn't there. You can label him as, Hey, any 20 goal scorer only scores once every four games, right? If that's kind of playing every game more or less, you still need to do other things. And so I mean, I believe DeBrusque has one goal so far this season. And so when he's saying, you know, you can't just be a goal scorer right now, your game is empty across the board. Yeah, he's got three goals this year. So far, three goals and three assists in 17 games. Right. Okay. So I see, and I think it's one in the last chunk, right? Cause those yeah. two of them came at the very beginning. Yeah. And like, it's obviously not good enough for him, but what I think is interesting, obviously his coach, there's some frustration there. The team needs more out of him. What's interesting is if you look at his per 60 stats last year versus this year, they're essentially the same. Uh, like, like I'm looking at five on five points per 60 last season, he played in 41 games. He was at 1.3 points per 60 this year. He's at 1.5 points per 60. So better by 0.2. Yeah. yeah I mean, but still now is that, uh, then what is leading to this change? Is he getting less ice time than he was last year? <sighs> That is a great question. Let me find the ice time on here. Average time on ice? No, he's actually playing 30 seconds less on average. So he is getting a little bit less ice time this year. Yeah. Okay. Which, I mean, if the coach isn't happy, right? Like ice time needs to be reduced before you're getting to healthy scratch levels. Otherwise, you're not making wise choices. So it's understandable that he's going to be getting uh, those, those smaller amounts. But I mean... Bruce Cassidy refers to him as a 20 goal scorer. 
and it's happened once for him. I mean, yeah, he had hit 19 once and didn't play a full season with that, that COVID shortened year last year. He only had five. Like, I think at this point, right. If that's what your expectation of Jake DeBrusque is a 20 goal scorer, then the organization needs to readjust and realign their thinking too. Well, I mean, he used 16 goals, 27 goals, 19 goals. Like, I don't think it's it, last year. I don't think it would have been wrong for them to hope he, or to assume he could net 20 goals. That seems reasonable. That's your stretch target for a guy who did 16, 27, 19 over the last three seasons. You hit 20 goals, but he shows up and he puts in five. And even like last year, his ice time dropped by over a minute per game. Yeah. So, you know, I I don't remember hearing about any of these issues last year, but to me, it's pretty clear in the numbers that this is an issue that started last year and it's not going away. No, it's not. And I think, and with the addition of Taylor Hall this year, right, it gave them that option uh, to to not have to play him, right? They brought in a, a depth guy who's, you know, I mean, they don't play the same role on this team, but they also brought in Nick Foligno. Like, they brought in pieces that are taking some of those spots. Now, granted, Foligno and Hall aren't doing what they should be either, right? I think the Bruins should be expecting more out of a lot of players on this team right now, but uh, DeBrusque certainly is one of them. Yeah, for sure. So a 25 year old winger who previously scored 27 goals in a season three years ago, now isn't scoring more than five. I mean, they're, they're not going to get what they want for him. Especially when the agent comes out and asks for a trade, when you know that he's on the market, your value has been tanked totally totally yeah even more so than just looking at the stat lines so uh i don't know this is gonna be a tough one i feel like this is gonna get ugly i don't think do you think he gets traded do you think that they find a way to work it out um i what's it what does his deal look like because i think that plays into this as well let me pull up their their cap friendly Cause I mean, I think that there is a market for him, right? It's not going to be what Boston wants, especially with like, cause I believe they have him locked up like decently long for term. Nope. They do not. He's in the final year of his deal. So then he's an RFA with arbitrage who's eligible for arbitration. Okay. So that's kind of what I was thinking, right? just that there's that RFA side of it. So, I mean, worst case scenario, they just let someone offer sheet him and they don't match at the end of this year. But I mean, making 3.675 right now, if you had to also give up a pick of whichever variety, like on an open market without RFA, what kind of deal do you think Jake DeBrusque would get on like a three-year deal? What do you think he'd get? Oh, man. 25-year-old... Honestly, like, what do I think he would get? What do I think he should get? Probably exactly where he's at <laughs> So for the next six. three years. Yeah. yeah. Like a three, 10, 11 year deal. Well, so if that happens, you only have to give up uh, a second round pick to get him on an offer sheet. For a guy that, I mean, has been, can be a 20 goal scorer, you're giving him more time. You're not burying him on other lines. You're, able to get him into a fresh, healthier situation. Would you give up a second round pick for DeBrusque? I think so. Yeah. I think with what we know about second rounders. Yeah. But doesn't that seem like a fair trade anyways? Like that's a trade that I could see happen this year. Yeah. And I I think there's lots of teams that would do it. Yeah. Right. With the Bruins. Why not? If you're literally not playing him anyways, take what you can get. Take your pick. For sure. All right. Let's take a break right here. We'll be back on the other side looking at our Connors and Coyotes. Three, two, one. We're back for our Connors and the Coyotes. Connors being the best because Connor McDavid is the best. 
who coincidentally actually this week was uh, held to his first pointless game of the season. It, it took him until late November to not have a point in a game. Is he going to be your coyote for this week? <laughs> I, and last week, I, last week, one of us put the coyotes as the Connor. So I think we have to put a Connor <laughs> as the coyote, don't we? It'll, it'll come. It'll come at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. C- playoff time. That's when that's happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's, let's talk about our best and the worst. Why don't, why don't you kick us off? All right. Whichever one you want to start with. Uh, I'm going to go with my best because it brought me a lot of joy. Uh, this goes back. This one actually happened Saturday. Uh, oddly enough, actually Friday, it was Friday, um, back in Boston. So the scene of a lot of crimes that have happened this week, um, in this one crime, number one that they did was giving up a hat trick to Artemi Panarin. And here's the thing. That's not even what makes this the best of the week for him. Panarin scored three goals, but what I thought was the best. And this was before he even got suspended. They were yelling. Him and Marchand were yelling at each other from bench to bench, kind of right where they both meet. And uh, Panarin did not take too kindly to what Marchand said. So he picked up his glove and threw it at him from one bench to the other. And what I love about this is that it was the most harmless of things. I mean, when we look at all the things that Marchand does, And the ways that he literally two days later put Oliver Ekman Larson in harm's way by slew footing him to be upset at a guy and to throw a glove, which I mean, they're not particularly hard. You're wearing a helmet, a visor, all the equipment. It's the safest thing that you, that you have on your body that you could throw, right? A stick going to hurt more. A helmet would hurt more. I guess your Jersey, if you really wanted to take that off on the bench, but like throwing a glove is just the most harmless of things. Uh, and I just, and like from one bench to the other to like lean over and get that angle to hit the guy on the bench when like there's that divider in the middle, it's not easy. I just, everything about it, the comedy of watching him throw a glove at Marsh on the bench was by far my best of the week. It's almost playful, like lobbing your glove at another player. Yeah. Like I, I think, I mean, you see that in like a locker room all the time, right? Like someone does something, someone makes a joke, a bad joke. You like, you throw a glove at them. Yeah, exactly. Cause it's harmless and you're not going to hurt them. <laughs> right. <laughs> One thing I loved about the clip. Do you remember this would have been, I don't know how many years ago, but the Red Wings were playing the avalanche and there was, there ended up being a bit of a kerfuffle between the benches and someone dropped or poked the other bench with their stick. And the one player from the other bench grabbed the stick and pulled it and they scooped it up over their bench. Did you ever see that? Was this, I remember there was the one with Tyler Bertuzzi. Is that the one we're talking about? No, it's it's further back than that. It's further back. Anyways, so so one of the Avalanche players lost their stick in front of the Red Wings bench. The Red Wings player scooped it up over the bench, gave it to their trainer who carried it back, which is is hilarious. I'm going to send it to you to watch after. And in this clip, as soon as he threw the glove, Marshawn started to move his stick to scoop the glove up and the linesman grabbed his stick and threw it out of the way. Well, that's the thing, right? Like if that goes on the bet, you're not getting that glove back. It's that gone forever. hundred percent. hundred percent. So it's like also, right. Just the pettiness of the whole thing. It's amazing. I, it was so good to watch. And like, it, it would have been a high, it, that was an emotional game. I think going back and forth the way it did. First of all, is in the middle of the afternoon on a like Thursday or a Friday. Well, that was not even the middle of the afternoon because that was the Friday after Thanksgiving. The Boston Bruins always play a very early game. I think there's, I want to say that's when like, is that when the Boston Marathon is? I know there's an event that they hold on that day. Um, and so I think they always play an 11 a.m. or right. 1 p.m. local time game. So it's, it's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This game, I don't know if you watch it. It start. This game started off all Boston. Like the first period, they decimated New York in shots. They outshot them like 20 to two or something crazy. Yeah. And then they took a lead in the game, and the entire second half of the game, New York clawed back the game, and they ended up winning like five to two. Yeah. And so, so the emotional swing 
I think was pretty big. And you could just see Marshawn's frustration throughout the game. Absolutely. And I did, I did misspeak. Uh, it was not a Panarin hat trick. I was going to um, say. I, I like, I, I like that think you trusted so. me though. I, I did trust you. I didn't start looking it up. Um, but you were right. I was wrong. Um, yeah, right. Definitely an emotional game. Apparently, and so Marshawn was mic'd up for this game, which is interesting. Um, because apparently it was a lot of uh anti-Russian sentiment that got Panarin upset. And I think we all what I learned through this is that there's an agreement with the NHLPA, and it makes a ton of sense at this point in time, but unless the ref hears it, the NHL is not allowed to punish a player by anything that is caught on a microphone that they are wearing by being mic'd up. Hmm. Which seems like open season for Brad Marchand to do whatever he wants in that game then. Well, uh, no different from any other game though, right? <laughs> like As, I, as well, long I, as the ref doesn't hear it. I guess that's true. But it's just like, you're like, I always wonder why would Brad Marchand ever want to mic himself up? Like there's, you're absolutely going to do something dumb, but, uh, and I, I would think that there is a point that that line would change. Like if you say something incredibly offensive, the NHL would have to step in and do something. About uh, it. I, I would think so, especially because they've got it on tape, <laughs> but apparently there's a gray area where if you say something only slightly offensive, and derogatory towards someone or where they're from, which I think shouldn't be a thing you're doing, Bradley. Uh, apparently, you can't get caught for that. I was so curious. Like, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm so curious to know what he said because Panarin is one of the Russians who doesn't speak kindly about the situation back home. Right. So you know, it's. It, I'm just in this tape's never going to see the light of day. I'm just interested to know what got him so fired up, but yeah, apparently that's, that's a no, no from the player's perspective. And Panarin had a great line in his uh, post-game interviews too, about the fine. Maybe so it was a post game $5,000 fine. Yeah. In where he thanked his previous GM for signing him to an $11 million contract. <laughs> Yeah, thank you to the Rangers for sent, giving me eleven point six million dollars. I think I'll be fine. <laughs> Amazing. That's, a, that's great logic. Love it. Uh, so that's my best of the week. I just that brought me a lot of joy. I watched that. I don't know how many times I watched that GIF on repeat of him throwing that glove at him, but it so was good. It was a lot. So uh, good. What was your best? Okay, you're gonna like my best. Okay, because my best is a defenseman who had probably the best week of any defenseman this last week. I know where this is going. Four games, four goals, three assists, two multi-point games. When he was named a star of the game the other night, the fans threw literal kale on the ice, which really, that was the action that cemented this for me as my best. (laughs) Yeah. They threw kale on the ice for Kale McCarr. It was actually, uh, that was actually Nathan McKinnon in the stands, just throwing his post-game meal uh, out onto the ice. So he must've been out distributing it. Hey, yeah. He was like, Hey, Kale, here's your meal. Uh, don't eat until you come back, which I thought I mean, is fitting, right? Cause I remember back, uh, he actually was a member of the avalanche at a time too. So it works out very well that Nathan McKinnon was not, with Andrew Hammond at the same time that Sens fans were throwing hamburgers on the ice <laughs> after his games. Cause you, I mean, you could only imagine his reaction to that. Yeah. Amazing. Just like an unbelievable week for Kale McCarr. He was also named the NHL's third star of the week after Chris and Tristan Jari, who had to just go have the best week ever and destroy me in fantasy hockey, but we won't talk about that. Oh, we should. I was, I'm, I'm going to change my worst of the week. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> shouldn't, have brought, shouldn't have brought that up. But no, Kale McCarr is my best of the week. Cherry on top being all the kale thrown on the ice for him. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a nice touch. Av, Avs fans do a great job with the, the three stars. And 
uh, sticking around for that. I think, I mean, he had an amazing week and, and what he's able to do, get it with, you know, especially with Nathan McKinnon out, seeing this team, you know, get their way back into a playoff spot, looking like the team that should be able to win the, I mean, pre, well, they won the president's trophy last year. They're good enough to do it again this year. And they're actually looking like a competent quality team again. Nurse trophy. I, I don't see why not. I mean, he's got to be a fight. He was a finalist last year. He should by every rights be a finalist again this year. It'll be interesting. See if he can continue to shoot at 18.8%. I, I think that's going to come back to earth a little bit. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but I I think, what was it? Was it last year or two years ago? The year that John Carlson started out just like gangbusters and leading the league in points, right? We see defensemen do this every year. They come back to reality. The only reason, now that you've said this, uh, I'm going to do my thing where I make a strong stance and then change my mind. Um, okay. And that is that recency bias is a big thing in NHL awards voting. And so I don't think that they'll remember this. If he was doing this in March, April, then for sure. Uh, but he's still in the conversation. He'll probably still be a finalist. I think absolutely. That seems accurate to me. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, we could talk about Kill McCarl all day. Anything else you want to talk about? Him? No, no, I don't want to talk about him anymore. We can do our worst of the week. Okay. Uh, uh, should I go first? Is yours going to require a bigger conversation? I, I've, I now have two worsts of the week. So I'll start with one of mine and then you can take yours and then I'll give my other one second. Okay. 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 My worst of the week was that one of us had to lose fantasy hockey this week. Uh, we played each other, which you've been having. I mean, you've turned your season around. I know that like, the standings are so tight that like, it's hard to gain a lot. Um, Cause I won this week and dropped a position. I'm no longer first. I'm now third. Um, but it, it's disappointing because I did not want to stand in the way of the Nick Sagan resurgence. It's, it's hard, man. You have to work at it. <laughs> it's like a daily thing. Like you have to make sure you're using your drops. You have to make sure your ads. I mean, you get four ads per week. You have to use them strategically and you got to be strategic with your goalies too. And if you're winning in certain categories and your opponent doesn't have any goalies playing, don't play your goalies. Don't risk it. It's true. The so one I've been thing paying does, like ultra close attention. The one thing that does save us is we went with the Yahoo default stats um, and it's total saves instead of save percentage this year. So yes. Um, and wins instead. So there's actually one, only one negative category for goalies with three positive ones. And I think that makes it less likely that you need to really keep those out. But it's true because you, you won that saves category by eight saves last week. Well, and I won it because I was coming after you last night. I, I won nervous. it because I added, what's the goalie's name in Vancouver? Is it? Uh, uh, well, Halak played last night. Was it Halak? I added him yesterday. He was the only goalie who was available as a free agent who was playing last night i think yeah so i added him because i was behind in saves i was winning in goals against and i was behind by one in a win so i really needed a vancouver win with over like 32 saves or something so and, and he got 39 saves he did give up three goals so we tied in goals against but I mean, in the end, you, you got an extra category, which is all that matters. Yeah. But I lost my goals against category. Yeah. But you gained, like you gained one and tied uh, one. I guess so. so. I, I came out even. You gained half a category is what you did. But I mean, uh, so that's my worst of the week though. Not your performance. Cause you had a, I mean, it was close. Like there wasn't a single match category that really got blown away. Maybe. I mean, goals, and goals. Shots. I doubled you up and shots, but. It was, it was a tight match, man. It kept going back and forth. I felt every day assists, hits, blocks, just yeah. swinging. Uh, downside for you this week, that Brad Marchand that I traded you earlier this year. Yeah. He's not playing for you this week. I know. I have to figure out what to do about that. That's a tomorrow problem. It's true. All right. Uh, what's your worst of the week? 
Okay, I'm also changing my worst of the week up because another incident happened in the league that we didn't put in our show notes. Do you know which one? I, I can't believe we forgot about it. I was bite. actually. Ooh, okay. Because there's that's an, there's another one that uh, we forgot to to add into here. The bite, yes. Brendan Brendan Lemieux, I think it's Brendan Lemieux, and yeah. oh, man, one of the Kachuk brothers, Brody, Brady Kachuk, mm-hmm. not Matthew. And Brendan Lemieux and Brady Kachuk get into a scuffle like a yesterday or the match. day before, like a wrestling match on the ice. Brady Kachuk comes out with a bloody palm, like kind of on the inside of his finger. And he's just mouthing over and over again. He bit me. 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 It was clear as day on camera. And he had a bite mark on the inside of his hand. Brendan Lemieux bit him and drew blood. Yeah. An unreal. I mean, and he we've got seen thrown it before. out of the game for it too. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, we, we've me. seen it before. No, no, it's all good. Uh, we've seen it before, but certainly, I mean, not, uh, not in some time and especially not like, I think, cause what, I think we all think of the Alex Burroughs, like biting of the finger situation. This was just like, just gnawing on someone in a scrum. Like this is worse than that. He drew blood. And it's, that's, ah, it's just, it's awful. It's gross. He got thrown out of the game. You can't, and especially, I mean, I guess this like, you know, whatever they're all COVID doesn't really matter when you're wrestling a guy to the ice anyways, but like, don't be like drooling on someone's hand. If you can avoid it. That does seem, I mean, I haven't even touched another person's hand in now years <laughs> to put that person's hand in my mouth. Just seems unfathomable. Right it's now. so gross. It's so gross. And we don't see it very often biting in hockey. But I got to imagine it's in that unwritten code. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it should be in the written code, right? They he did get kicked out of the game. Uh, supplemental discipline, I believe, is still pending for him. Is that correct? Yeah, he was offered in a quote unquote in person hearing. I think it's done on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so I think supplemental discipline is coming done via uncle gary's table he's just gonna zoom in yes and, and we'll just see what's happening there so uh i mean interesting interesting situation um so if we, i now have a couple to choose from because i was gonna switch up my worst of the week as well um so we've just got a lot of worse hanging out here so i'm gonna go with mine and then you can give your original worst then how about that okay sounds good because my new worst of the week is the New York Islanders who have had their next few games canceled because of a, another COVID outbreak that we have in the league leading to the cancellation of games. So uh, they had yesterday's game against the New York Rangers canceled. Uh, they'll be having uh, their next game, which was originally scheduled for tomorrow. So Tuesday's game canceled, trying to get back going by Thursday. I was wondering why some of my players on my team were showing as uh, uh, games being delayed. That makes sense now. That is why. So future Nick is going to get like a bunch of games in. Uh, so that's great. You know, talking about teams that are struggling, the New York Islanders are one of them. I, I mean... Look, I'm not ever going to say something as dumb as that, like a COVID situation like this helps the team. But if there's any team in the league right now that needs just like an extra break to reset and reevaluate and get going again, it's the Islanders. Totally, totally agree with you. It's a, it's an awful thing to hear that so many people got sick to the point that they have to start canceling games. You know, we talked about this when it happened with Ottawa. It's not a great, it's not a great thing for the league, especially this year with the Olympics coming up and, and the NHL's status kind of pending there. Um, but you're right. It's not a, an awful thing for the Islanders to take a pause, take a breather, maybe watch a little more tape and reset. I say Netflix, just get away from the rink for a second. Just go watch Tiger King 2 
and there's no Tiger King 2. Yes, there is. There's Tiger King 2. There is Tiger King 2. I have not heard anyone who's watched it yet, um, but Tiger King 2 most certainly exists. Wow. Um, I think it focuses more on Carol Baskin this time. Gotcha. Um, Yeah. They should, what they really should do is go back and listen to our summer episodes because there's a bunch of good movie recommendations in there. It's true. Yeah. That, that sounds great. I mean, I saw in the, in the, that part of the world, it was snowing recently. So they probably got that same snow that you got. So just, you know, snuggle up by the fire, put on a movie. Hey, it's Christmas movie season. You can watch any of those. It is. I watched a good one last night. What'd you watch? I watched a movie called 8-Bit Christmas. It's a new one that just came out this year. Hmm. And it's Neil Patrick Harris is, he's not, he's kind of the main character, but he's explaining to his daughter, he's telling the story of in the late 80s when he was trying to get his first Nintendo for Christmas. Ooh. It's a fun movie. I remember when I got my first Nintendo. It was actually a PlayStation, but it was a great Christmas. Sure was, Carl. Uh, okay. We have some other worst stuff that we need to get through. Yes. My worst was it was kind of a joint worst that I was going to go. And it was just like high money players on waivers. Cause this week we saw Matt Murray go on waivers and clear. And yesterday, the day after Matt Murray, Evander Kane finally had something happen with him as the end of his suspension nears. Uh, Evander Kane went on waivers as well. Tomorrow, I think his suspension's up. Yeah, so I think that was a kind of a preemptive let's see what we can do to get rid of him move. Now, there's a few things on this Evander Kane thing. So he was suspended for falsifying a vaccine certificate. Correct. Now they're saying he's double vaxxed. So, I, so you know, maybe he went and got that done with his time off. Uh, otherwise, why would he falsify the record? Right, which I, I guess because they have to be what like six weeks apart. It's been six weeks into the NHL season, so I guess that's enough time for him to actually get it. Yeah, so he's gone and switched management companies, I believe, or management firms. Uh, yeah, probably a, a good move for him to get a fresh start. Hopefully, these guys are telling him, "Look, you listen to us now. Whatever we say, you do. Go get vaccinated." Um, he's been sent down to the Barracuda. He's cleared the waivers. Apparently San Jose is looking for a trade destination for him and is prepared to retain 50% of his salary. 50% of Evander Kane's salary is the exact same as Jake DeBrusque's salary. I'd just like to point that out. There you go. That's kind of an interesting, uh, thought, Carl. Just, just came to my mind right now. Uh, does Boston do that? San Jose absolutely does that and doesn't probably think twice about it. Does Boston take that chance? I mean, you hope no, but I can see them doing it. And there's a, there's a situation in my head that I can imagine that happening. I could see it happening. Yeah. Wouldn't surprise me. That's a good thought, Carl. Look at that. You Heard it here first, folks. Evander Kane is heading off to Boston. This is what we mean when we say we're, we grind out our thoughts on hockey. Yeah. It took us an hour, and Carl just made an amazing uh, proposal. There you go. You know who should have hired? They shouldn't have gone with Jeff Gordon, NASCAR driver. They should have gone with Carl Landra, NASCAR fan. Hockey trade genius. Um, just takes him 60 minutes of just, every meeting to figure out what he wants to do. <laughs> and I, you know what? I think that's worth it. I think, you know, if you just, just stew on it a little bit and everything will be fine. <laughs> totally. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other worsts? Did we get through all the worsts? We got through the worst. Yeah. I don't think there's much to say about Matt Murray and he's having an awful season. I mean, he's an awful goalie. I'm kind of surprised that when he took him on the, off the waiver wire, but. It's the term that he still has. Like, yeah, why would rough. I want that? Like, if it was the last year of his deal, maybe, but no, no, thank you. All right. 
let's head to our high sticking segment where we do our Pavel Burrays. We pick the best games of the week. And last week we teased the idea that we're going to do a 12 days of Christmas and it's starting to come together. We've got the prizes we're starting to pick because we've got to figure out two things to make this happen. Okay. We got to figure out what prizes are we going to give away? Mm -hmm. 12 prizes in 12 days. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're saying we're doing. Is that Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 12 prizes in 12 days. Uh, And also what are we going to do to give away 12 prizes in 12 days? So we're, we're open to ideas as we figure it out. I mean, we've got, we've got some parts of both figured out, but uh, if there's something that you think, you know what, I would do this to get a prize. Okay. And I think we've done, I mean, I think back to some of the, like the questions that we had where it was just like, answer a question uh, about like, you know, hockey history or your history with hockey, just like, you know, a fun way to talk to people, share stories, have fun Mm -hmm. at Christmas. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good way. Some skill testing trivia. That's like, not just Googleable. It's always a fun one. Um, But and then our high sticking games, which we do. So that's coming. But for, for now, we're still working to way towards uh, the end of this se- third of a season prize as well, where we're going to be uh, hand no prizes, fourth line swag as well. Head on to our Twitter at fourth line podcast and play high sticking, which tonight, oddly enough, has the penguins who are obviously for sale uh, or I guess being sold. bought, <laughs> sold, not, not for sale anymore. Uh, they're playing the flames. That's our game tonight. So you'd head over there, pick one player per team that you think will score a game winning goal and you can win. So what do you see as our best game of the week for tomorrow? The final day of November tomorrow, the final day of November. It's gotta be Washington, Florida. Washington, Florida is a great matchup. I also looked at, uh, Dallas Carolina is a matchup later in the day, which I think would be a good one too. Yeah. Agreed. Wednesday. I see two games that are of interest, but I think Colorado Toronto is the one. Yeah. I'm yeah. Both of those teams are on heaters right now. That'll be a, a I think, I mean, a high scoring game. Toronto defensively and in net, right? Joseph Wall's been, a good find in net for them. Um, a long while since Toronto's actually developed and brought up a goalie. <laughs> yeah. So, so very long while. <laughs> um, uh, so are we at Thursday now? We are at Thursday, December 2nd. Uh, you know what I think we should do since the Kachucks have such a great history with the LA Kings, we should go Calgary LA. Ooh, that'll be good. Matthew Kachuk. It's been a while, right? Because they have they Kings and Flames didn't play last year. Let's see if him and Drew Doughty renew acquaintances. Yes. Uh, let's take then on to Friday the third. We talked about very few of these teams this week, actually. Um, let us go. My goodness, these are there are not good games on Friday. Uh yeah. It, let's do San Jose, New York. Let's do San Jose, New York. Sure. San Jose against the Rangers. We talked about Pan- right Panarin. We talked about Panarin. We talked about Evander. Maybe they'll just leave him in New York. <laughs> On Saturday, I'm looking Tampa, Boston as, yeah. as my game of the week. Um, West Coast games or Western Conference games that day. I mean, Blues Panthers, another early game. Wake up a little early on Saturday and watch that. Or I guess that was, that's, was that Sunday? That was Sunday. So what about then on to next uh, Saturday, December 5th, Sunday? What do you got? Uh, Sunday, what do we got? No more Flyers games. No more Flyers games. I saw, I mean, lots of uh, Leafs, Jets. Do you remember those games from last yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, that'll be a good game. I was good because I think we've picked every other team that's playing, so we're bound to watch a team twice. Let's do Toronto, Winnipeg. 
And I'm not sold on the idea of picking an Islanders game in case it gets canceled. No, agreed. So, so we don't have to make a late change, a late swap. Let's do that. Then brings us to Monday. Uh, I believe let's give the Pittsburgh Penguins with possibly their new ownership group uh, a swing as they're in Seattle. So Pittsburgh and Seattle. What do you think? Done. About that? Been a while since we picked Seattle. It has been. So that'll be back to back Mondays that Pittsburgh will be our high sticking game, which is just a weird coincidence. So head to our Twitter, which is at fourth line podcast with the number four, and you can play high sticking. Uh, it's as easy as that. We send out a tweet, you reply to it, you're in. Uh, in fact, we'll send out another tweet here as the show wraps up. Remind folks, because that game starts in 20 minutes. So uh, head on over there. You can go to the fourth line podcast.com for more about the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to shows. We're there. Full Press Radio, we're over there as well. Thank you very much for tuning in this week. Till next time. Time for us to wrap up another fourth line show. I know what you're thinking. You don't want us to go. Brad Marchand is still acting really goony. If I could throw my glove at him, I would pay the toonie, which is the equivalent of that fine, which is ridiculous. (laughs) 